Long overdue. I have been promising you guys a 2012 race recap video for a very long time, but here's the problem. I've made this video several times, and every time I do, not only does it get demonetized, but every single time it gets copyright infringement, and it won't even let me make the video public. That's how iron tight the IOC is on its property. So even though it's a commentary video and I believe that it falls under fair use uh, practices, the IOC will not let me post this video. So in order for me to do a proper 2012 race recap, I am going to have to use pictures, but I have a lot of pictures from behind the scenes and from the race itself. I'm going to tell you exactly how the 2012 Olympic final went down for this guy who finished fifth. Here we go. Now, first of all, what you've got to realize is that what the world sees, what, you know, several billion people tune into, that final, that's just one of three races that every single person in that final had to run to get there. In the men's 800, they take about, oh, the 60-some of the fastest 800-meter runners in the world, and they put them through rounds, right? So you have to get through the prelims. They'll take 24 of the fastest people of those 60 and put them into semis, three heats of eight. And then in the semis, they'll run the three heats of eight, top two across the line make the final, and then the two fastest times from those three heats. Now, would you believe it? I only snuck into the final via time. In the semis, I drew David Rudisha, who was pretty, he ended up getting the world record. So we all knew he was a lock for the final. Um, and so we were all, the seven other guys were all competing for that one extra spot. I glued myself to David Rudisha's shoulder in the semifinal. And with 100 meters to go, it seemed for sure that I was going to take that second auto qualifying spot. But we were racing in London and there was a UK athlete by the name of Andrew Asagi in my heat. And the crowd rose to their feet with this deafening roar. They cheered Andrew Asagi to the line and he snuck in for that second spot. Fortunately, and I thank God every day that I was in this heat that went out fast, I, I leaned at the line and was able to run a fast enough time to be the fastest auto qualifier into the finals. Now. I didn't know it when I crossed the line because I was in the second of three heats. If the third heat ran faster, I wouldn't be able to take one of those uh, time qualifying spots. I would be sitting, you know, on a couch watching the race like everybody else. But I, I sat down on the track. I took my spikes off. The, uh, the volunteers, they're saying, sir, sir, you have to leave. You have to leave. I said, I'm not leaving this track until I know what happens in this race. And I glued myself to the track, just sat there. And fortunately, they were nice. They let me watch the third heat that Dwayne Solomon was running in. And incredibly enough, both Dwayne and I advanced. Uh, I think Dwayne was also a time qualifier. We advanced from the semis into the final, into what would become the greatest 800 meter race in history. Um, prelims are on one day. Semis are on the second day. Then everyone who's made the finals gets a day of rest which is a blessing and a curse, because on the one hand, you really want to rest, you just ran two 800s. On the other, it's just 24 extra hours to just be playing mental tricks with yourself, right? So I'm panicked, I'm stressed, I'm excited, but just trying to conserve energy as best I can on this off day. Thank goodness my family was there. I spent some time with them. I, I, you better believe I called my sports psychologist, Jeff Trosh, a few times to kind of work through the, the butterflies that were in my stomach. I talked with my coach about tactics. Long story short, I conserved energy so that on the day of the finals, I woke up excited with a game plan, um, ready for anything. Now, we all kind of knew how this race was going to unfold. David Rudisha had told the media after the semis, I'm going to go out hard and try to run wire to wire in a world record time. At the time, they asked me, Nick, what do you think about that? And I laughed, I said, listen, I, I've been in world record races with David, but we had rabbits, we had perfect conditions. There's no way David Rudisha is gonna run a world record in the finals. Well, shows what I know about the 800, I guess. On the day of the race, it was an late afternoon or evening race, I can't remember. Um, but I just remember being so excited for the opportunity. I kept telling myself, don't waste this opportunity. This is probably gonna be your only chance to race for an Olympic gold medal, um, but but embrace at the same time. And you know, as I was having these like moments of absolute joy and excitement mixed with moments of being absolutely terrified, I, I remember talking to my sports psychologist and I said, Jeff, how am I gonna walk out on that track in front of several billion people and, and how am I gonna race, you know, 
for the in the biggest arena, the biggest moment of my life, and I just the the nerves I was dealing with were overwhelming. And he said this; it stuck with me to this day. He said, "As you walk out there and you're feeling those nerves, I want you to just look down at the track." And remember that that track is 400 meters around, just like every other track you've ever run, up, run on. It's covered in rubber. And just get out of your own mind and do what your body does best. You've trained for this for 15 years at this point. Just run. And he said, if you are worried about the people out there watching you, when they say your name, just throw up your hands and smile and let them know that you're having more fun than anyone else. Because win or lose, you're out there, you're a man in the arena, you're there fighting the good fight and be the guy that's having the most fun. So I took those two things with me to the starting line. Um, really tried to just calm myself down, get my heart rate down. Um, and once I had done that, I spent some time just replaying in my mind, using visualization. How is this race going to come uh, and unfold? My coach, Mark Rowland, and I knew pretty well how this was going to unfold. We said, David's going to go out. Actually... <laughs> I told, I told Mark Rowland, I said, so coach, do I have any chance to win this? He goes, Nick, you are not going to win this race. That's one of the things I loved about Mark Rowland. He's a straight shooter. He said, Nick, you're not going to win this race, but David is going to go out and run you know, an incredible time, and everyone's going to try to go with him. They're going to go way too fast. They're going to fade on the home stretch. And he said, if you do this, if you go out in 50.5 and you come back in 52.5, You'll run 143.0 and you'll be the Olympic silver medalist. Well, that sounded pretty good to me. I knew those were splits I could hit. Even though at the time my personal best I think was, I want to say, 143.7. This would be almost a full second personal best for me to run a 143.0. I knew that my training was there. I knew that my taper was perfect. I knew I had a legit shot of running 143.0. Starter calls us to the line. My heart is pounding out of my chest. I just... If there's anything worse than, you know, the nerves leading up to a race, it's that moment when you're right on the starting line and you just want to be set free. Fires the gun and we're finally off. And now, if you've watched my career, you know I almost always am one of the slower guys off the line. But in this race, it seemed like I was stuck in quicksand. Everyone was out so freaking fast. I mean... If you've ever watched the 1972 Men's 800 Olympic Final, they said, you know, Dave Waddle was so far off the pack, they actually asked, the announcer asked, I wonder if he's injured. I was thinking in the back of my mind, they're going to think I'm injured, I'm so far off the pace. But in the back of my mind, I'm hearing Mark Rowland saying, just run your own race, hit your own splits, they will die. I mean, it was a very inexperienced field. I thought a lot of these youngsters would get caught up in the moment and would fade down, you know, the, the, fade in the second lap. Coming through... David's 23 low. People are lined up right next to him. I'm dead last a couple meters off, but I hit my split perfect. And as we come down the home, uh, home stretch, the crowd is going nuts. They know how fast this race is. And I just think to myself, match the move. You'll know, try to get up on at least the, the seventh place person's heels. You know, I don't ever want to have a gap forming between me and the guy that I'm trying to be running with, but they're just so fast. I can't bring myself to get up on his heels. I'm thinking to myself, I'm running my own race. I'm at the exact pace I'm supposed to be. And true enough, as I come through 400 meters, I'm still in last place, but I hit my split perfect 50.5. Now I'm getting kind of excited because I know how fast everyone else has gone. I'm like, David's probably going to win this race. And he may actually won, run the world record, contrary to what I thought he would do. Uh, but this is where people are going to start to die. You know, with 300 meters to go, wheels are going to start falling off. As, at least that's what I thought. Coming down the back stretch, I'm starting to, you know, kind of peer around the seventh place person's shoulder. I'm thinking, it's time for me to start making some moves. I've got to start picking people off. But where is everyone dying? They refuse to die. I continue to just say, stay patient, stay patient. It will happen. It's not about who's winning at 600 meters. It's not about who's winning at 700. It's not even about who's leading at 799 meters. All that matters is that last meter and where you're at. So as I come off you know, with 150 meters to go, I'm, I'm just confident that everyone except David is going to start fading down the home stretch. And so I start winding up my big kick, coming off that last corner. I slingshot into lane two, and I stand tall, and I'm giving it everything I got, digging as deep as I've ever dug for a finish line. I kind of close my eyes and just dig deep, trying to maintain my form. I pick off one, I pick off two. As I'm coming into the finish line, I lean forward, 
for fifth place. When you're in the men's 800, it's a chaotic finish, but your your peripheral vision, you you, all, you know exactly where you're finished. I mean, I, I knew the minute I finished that I was fifth. I knew that I'd done everything I could possibly do to hit that. The only thing I didn't know was my time. And so, as I stood there realizing that I wasn't going to realize my dream of winning an Olympic medal, I thought, well, it was a mediocre showing. You know, I, I probably ran 143 high and, and that's, you know, all, all I was able to pull off today. And then the time started popping up on the board and it said Simmons. Well, first of all, it said Rhodesia world record. So I was, I was actually genuinely excited for him. I ran up to him and gave him a big hug. Um, and then it said, you know, the other finishers names. And then it said Simmons fifth place, 142.95. And I just thought to myself, we're at the Olympic Games and they can't even get the times right. I, 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 at the time, I could not actually believe that my body had run under 143. I never in my entire career even dreamed that I would be capable of running that fast. You know, I thought maybe 143 low, certainly, but never under 143. So, I, you know, for the first few minutes, I was just there in a state of disbelief. Uh, as I watched the medalists take their lap, I'm like, is, is that possibly right? Even as I went into the mix zone and met with the media, I kept asking, is, are these times right? Have they verified the times? Because I just couldn't believe it. And I guess that's what makes this moment so bittersweet for me as I look back on it. I'm so disappointed that I didn't come away with the medal. But at the same time, I couldn't control what the other athletes were going to run. I, I mean, it's the world's greatest 800 meter race for a reason. Seven out of eight of those athletes ran a personal best in that race. That's unheard of. Uh, a new world record, new uh, national records, uh, area records. It's, it's just an incredible moment where everybody showed up and everybody ran well. I controlled what I could control, right? And that's all we can ask of ourselves as athletes. I controlled all of the variables, my preparation, my race plan, hitting my splits perfectly. In fact, I found an even extra five hundredths of a second to get under 143. Everything that I could control, I controlled perfectly. But again, I couldn't control what the other athletes were capable of on that day. And bringing the best race of my life was only good enough for fifth place. And I think you just have to look at yourself and be proud if you are able to rise to the occasion to perform at, at an A plus level, the best you've ever performed at the highest level of competition. And that's what I did that day. So, you know, uh, I wish I could say I came to that conclusion that night. I didn't, I was, I was actually pretty disappointed for a long time afterwards. Um, I didn't watch that race for several years because it was, it was really hard for me to, to think about that moment. And, um, you know, working with my sports psychologist, I, I eventually came to the understanding that uh, we can only control the things that we can control. Now that night, fortunately, I was surrounded by my family and friends. You know, there were dozens of people that had flown out to watch me. We went out for drinks. Uh, we went out for food. We stayed up till, you know, all hours of the night uh, partying. And I think if I look back on my career, so funny, like I... I barely remember what I did at most of the world championship finals, except for Moscow when I won a, a world silver. But all the other finals, I, mean, I made at least half a dozen finals. And I don't remember anything about them. But I remember all the parties afterwards. I remember spending time with my family and friends in Berlin. Um, I remember spending you know, time with Sam and, and Coach Roland commiserating over a beer in Daegu after we finished uh, fifth or sixth at that one. Young athletes, I know we're goal-oriented. I know that when we don't hit our goals or don't get the results that we want, it, it's devastating in the moment. But if this old 36 year old has been can tell you one thing, win or lose, surround yourself by the people who have cheered you on and helped you get there after the race. Don't pout. It's okay to be sad, but don't pout. Don't throw a temper tantrum because those moments, the celebration or the commiseration, commiseration, commiserating after a, a win or a loss, those are the moments that are probably going to stick with you the longest. So I hope that sheds some light on, uh, on how I approached that race, on how it unfolded, and how I ultimately dealt with the success and failure of that moment. Now, one thing I would be remiss if I didn't mention, a lot of times after a really great season, athletes tend to have a bad season, you know, coming off that high is tough. And so as the dust settled from the 2012 season, I looked back and I realized that many times after an Olympic year, 
The following year is sometimes what we call a weak year. You know, people coming off Olympic cycles that first year back is a world championship year and many times sleeper athletes like the old bison can sneak in and do things that maybe people didn't think they were capable of. The minute I, well, I took six weeks off after the Olympic season, the minute I got back to training for the 2013 season, I was so excited. I just thought to myself, maybe 2013's my year. True to form, all of the Olympic medalists were injured coming into the 2013 season. I had their season of my life at the age of 29. If you guys have a bad race, there's always another race just around the corner. See you next week.